All right, let's continue talking about social psychological research and let's finish up by talking about ethics and values as they relate to social psychology. First of all, the bottom line is we do want to study people, but we have an obligation to them and we need to protect them. People are not lab rats. That though is a pretty cute lab rat. Look at his blood red eyes. That's crazy. But people are not lab rats, and nonetheless, though, we put them in some awkward situations. Remember that Milgram study? These people are going through some serious stress. Sometimes when we're conducting research, we might be interviewing people and asking them to disclose secrets about themselves, their, their true feelings about things, and it, it can be very upsetting. And of course, we need to make sure that we protect their personal information. The bottom line is, it, it is both a moral and a legal responsibility that we have to practice some basic ethical principles. Let's talk about those next. In 1974, and I'm always stunned to see that year. I, I mean, you'd think that we would have had um, essentially laws and principles and guidelines in place for decades, but that's not the case. In 1974, the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare established some guidelines to help protect research participants. And one thing that it did was very important. It created what are known as IRBs, Institutional Review Boards. And they serve at various institutions like Ohio University as watchdogs for research. They are there to protect subjects, research participants, from any type of harm. And essentially what they're going to do is some type of cost-benefit analysis to determine if a researcher is going to conduct a study that is going to provide enough information uh, so that it would warrant or justify uh, the expense that it could cost, you know, uh, taking the time of the research participants, particularly um, if we might upset the research participants. Uh, if in any way we're going to put them in jeopardy, there needs to be a payoff. So there's always some type of cost benefit analysis. Let me just show you something real quickly. Ohio University, for example, has an Office of Research Compliance. It's in the Division of Research. And um, let's click here on one of the top links, Human Subjects Research IRB. Remember, that stands for Institutional Review Board. And the bottom line is this review board is going to review any proposed research that you have. So if you want to conduct some type of research study, you need to fill out a lot of forms and describe exactly what you want to do so that the members of the IRB can understand what you're going to do and then determine if it's likely to result in some good information and it's going to be worth putting the subjects through what they need to go through. So it says right here, all studies that involve humans are potentially subject to federal government regulations. This includes everything from clinical trials to surveys, interviews, and observation. Any research, including master's and doctoral projects, any research that is that calls for participation by people must be reviewed and approved by the Institutional Review Board before the project can begin. And then it goes on to discuss a variety of training modules that people need to complete before they do a research study. So this, this is serious business, and that's a good thing because our goal is to protect the research participants. Now, here are some other guidelines that are very important. The participants typically need to provide informed consent. And informed consent is an important phrase, and it consists of two important words. One is informed. So if I'm going to consent to something, I need to know what I'm about to get myself into. So you need to really describe what that study is about for me to give you informed consent. And of course, my consent, I'm talking, I'm saying like, okay, fine, this sounds good. I want to participate. And typically we provide something that they need to sign. So that's what we would mean by informed consent. Now, there are a couple situations where we don't need informed consent and the IRB would tell us this. So maybe an, an anonymous questionnaire, we might not need to get informed consent first. Naturalistic observation. So literally, if I'm going out there and I'm watching people in the world as they behave naturally, I might not need to ask everybody for informed consent. You know, like, hey, can I watch you as you're playing in the park? I can just sit there and watch them as they play in the park, just like anybody else. So I don't always need informed consent, but I almost always need informed consent. Here's another really important thing that came from these regulations that we're discussing. Um, participants typically must be debriefed. And that's particularly true if any deception was used in the study. And the bottom line when it comes to a debriefing is we need to let subjects know what the study was about. 
We need to make sure they understand the methods that we're using. We need to let them know what we're hoping to find and discover. And we need to answer any questions they have. And if any deception was used, we have to clear the air. We need to let them know exactly what was going on and how they were deceived. So it's important to set the record straight, essentially. That's what a debriefing is all about. And then researchers must also abide by professional codes of conduct based on the organization that they are members of. So for example, most psychologists are members of the APA, the American Psychological Association. Let me show you a website real quickly for that. Uh, where is that? Oh, it's actually right over here. APA.org, you can visit it. And if you go to their website, you will see right on the front page, there's a section for ethics. And you will see right here, you can click on the ethical principles of psychologists and their code of conduct. And this is serious business. If you're going to be a member of the APA, you have to abide by this code of conduct and these basic um, ethical principles. And if you were to click on each one of these sections, you'd see that the ethical principles go into great detail about a variety of things. So there are just some general principles. Um, things regarding human relationships, privacy, advertising, record keeping. But what we're interested in right now is section eight that has to do with research and publication. So you can see a lot of overlap here. The APA thinks it's very important that there is institutional approval. So in other words, if I have an IRB at Ohio University that needs to review my research before I start conducting it, the APA agrees. You need to make sure you go through your institution and get approval. Remember we talked about informed consent? Well, the APA agrees. You know, if you're gonna conduct some type of research study, you need to make sure that your participants are informed about what you're gonna do and they consent, typically in writing. There are a lot of other little sections here that you might find interesting. You can always go to the APA website and read in more detail. Let me just give you a, a couple quick samples. Here's a section about offering inducements for research participation. So for example, maybe I'll say, hey, I'll give you some extra credit if you participate in my research study. Well, I need to make sure that I don't make that inducement too large because then I'm essentially bribing you. Um, that's just one of the many things that we have thought about ahead of time because I realize and, and psychologists realize that we can put you, students, at a disadvantage if we start holding over you some heavy inducements. You know, I, I, if I'm conducting some type of research study, I can't force you to participate in that research study because I'm your instructor. I need to offer you some opportunities to do something else to earn that type of credit. Bottom line is um, we thought about a lot of these things and a lot of these things are written about in the APA Code of Ethics. Talks about debriefings, talks about using animals in research talks about how to write up our research results. There's a lot of information there. Here's the final thing I wanna talk about, uh, values. People often view science as value-free, as completely objective, and nothing really involving human beings is completely objective. Scientific things are based on observation and measurement and objectivity. But as I mentioned, humans really can't be completely objective. Think about the ethics that we just talked about. They're based on moral values. Now, luckily, as a, as a group, as a society, Americans have strong moral values, and we believe that it's important to protect people, like our research participants. So that's not a bad thing, but of course, um, that's gonna differ from one society to another. So do, do values creep into science? Yes, of course they do. Think about the topics that we study. The topics that the researchers decide to study are very much based on their own specific human interests. So do values creep into science? Uh, of course, to some extent, our values, our interests creep into our scientific endeavors. But keep this in mind, the scientific methods that we've talked about for this entire chapter, they do help us protect against bias. And keep this in mind, the truth is out there. You know, there are right answers, there are wrong answers. Not everything is that simple, but the truth is out there. And scientists need to provide evidence for the truths that they are seeking. So it's not just based on their opinion. They need to provide evidence. And if they have to provide evidence, then we need to be objective in what we're studying if we're going to find that right answer. Keep in mind, science is often really slow. It takes a long time to learn a lot about human beings in particular. And here's another thing to keep in mind. It's a self-correcting process. So even if something like values get in the way and we start heading down the wrong path and we're not actually getting closer and closer to the truth, 
eventually other researchers will discover that because their research will point them in another direction. That's what I mean when I say that science is self-correcting. Over the long run, we will be pointing in the right direction because many people are studying the same thing and whoever has the best evidence wins. So think about how far science has taken us. There are, of course, some issues. We are human beings. We're not perfect. But the scientific method is very strong. And now you have a, a good cache of information uh, regarding how to evaluate scientific information. So that's what this chapter was all about, putting you in the position to evaluate the scientific information that we're going to be talking about all semester long. That's about it for this section. So stay tuned because there's much more social psychology coming up soon.